Welcome to Hashtag 52 Boundaries, and I'm so delighted to have with me Sally Thibault, who's a wellness coach, and we are going to talk about eating, specifically the boundaries around eating, because that is such a big topic. We've come, we've just come out of the holiday season, and um, this is January, and everybody's on a diet, right? So let's talk about the different kinds of boundaries. So we've got soft boundaries, which is basically people don't really have a lot of boundaries. Then we've got rigid boundaries where people are really firm in how they uphold their boundaries as and really rigid. So the, the soft boundary is somebody who always says yes, and rigid is somebody who always says no. And then we've got soft uh, spongy boundaries where, yeah, it could be yes, it could be no, depends on the person, depends on the situation. That's when people really go against their values and their beliefs, but they wanted to accommodate people. They put those, those needs aside as well. And then there are flexible boundaries where we are self-referencing, where we're checking in with ourselves, we're adjusting to circumstances and to people, but not from a place of, oh, I'll accommodate you, but it's about really working what works best for us. And we negotiate when we're coming from flexible boundaries. Mm. So that is just an introduction because I think since we're at the beginning of the series, it would probably be useful to give that another wrap up. Um, what does somebody look like who eats with soft boundaries? <laughs> Oh, well, Angela, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think all those things you were describing, I think many, in particular, women can relate to mm -hmm. all of that at various stages of their lives. Um, and those boundaries, the flexible boundaries to me are so critically important in the journey to learning to eat well. Because if you're either too rigid at one end or have no boundaries and soft boundaries at the other or even spongy boundaries, it will actually impact on your health and well-being. In yeah. the so firm, flexible boundaries, because firm boundaries are just as bad around food. You know, we end up with, with conditions such as ornithorexia, yes. which is where people won't eat anything that's not clean. or And, and those things, you know, that, that, that movement towards sticking to a really firm boundaries you know, is the thing that ends up with people being really in trouble with their mm. metabolic health in particular. So having flexible boundaries around food, and as you said, coming straight out of this, the um, festive season, give ourselves permission uh, to enjoy life, I think is really important. Yeah. Okay. So let's take it bit by bit. Let's start with soft boundaries. So when somebody has soft boundaries, um, that that would be, I, I know that I, I have you know, I used to have really spongy boundaries because I come from a family of food pushers and we'll talk about that in detail. But soft boundaries for me meant that I would overeat. I would just eat too much. I really enjoy food. I'm a foodie. And especially when there was company, I would just get into conversation. I would just eat way, way too much. But, you know, it's it's and it's a problem to self-regulate then afterwards, right? Mm. So well, you know, it's really interesting because um, in my experience, you know, having been kind of in this industry for a long, long time, most people eat for an emotional reason. Mm. To find somebody who eats purely for a physiological reason can be difficult to find. And if you've got those soft boundaries, what you're looking at is emotional eating, as you said. And so understanding that, understanding what those triggers are around those soft boundaries is incredibly important. Mm. Because in my experience, we reach for certain foods to satisfy a certain need yeah. that we have. So you might be a situation, for instance, and let's just talk about Christmas, sitting around the Christmas table, everybody's trying to be nice to each other because, you know, we get it once a year and everybody's keeping their mouths shut and doing what they're told. And, 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 and you know, some families get along very well and it's fine. There's a lot of families that don't, that come together at Christmas and, and kind of try and make happy families, especially with it's gone on in the last couple of years. So you might be in a situation, for instance, where somebody says something that triggers you, but you don't want to say anything because, you know, you don't want to start a, a, a war in the family or you just don't want to hurt somebody. We tend to reach for things that will shut our mouth, crunchy foods. Yeah. Um, things like uh, crunchy chocolate seem to be the emotional thing, that sweetness, but without without the ability to speak, whereas if you're kind of angry, and not wanting to speak to rich for things that like chips or uh, crackers, those types mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. And the understanding that that's 
that's what you're doing because what you're not able to do in referring to these soft boundaries is not being able to just stand in your own power to not have these things trigger you. And I think that that's those boundaries, those those flexible boundaries are incredibly important because, um, you know, there's going to be times where you're able to speak your truth and it's going to be times when you're not. Yeah. And knowing the difference. Yes. Where the real benefit comes from. Yeah, and then there's this whole thing about, yes, it's okay to eat some chips, but you don't have to eat the whole pack. Exactly. Right? Or the ice cream, you know, like I know people who say, once I start eating ice cream, I can't stop. I have to eat the full container. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because if you're not in an emotional state mm. at that point with those and, and have those soft boundaries, you're not able to listen to your body physiologically yeah. because a whole ice cream, you know, we've all done it, a whole ice cream container, an ice cream container to eat that much physically will make you ill. Your yeah. body doesn't like that. Too much sugar. Um, but when you're divorced from those emotions and you put the barrier up not to feel it, I remember years ago working with a psychologist and she was saying my biggest challenge is to get people to feel emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The work you're doing is incredibly important by identifying what the emotion actually is because we can we can put it into you know, big, broad baskets, I'm angry. Mm -hmm. Many times you're not. You think you are, but you're not. You're sad. You're yeah. guilty or, and, or missing out on something, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And and the thing that I find is sometimes we can reach when we're really stressed out, we can the comfort foods we reach for are the foods that remind us of happy times in the past. So it has nothing to do with a current situation. It's just the self-soothing, the Okay, I know that I remember that. And I know that I get when I get nostalgic and I'm, I, I miss certain foods, like, oh, grandma used to. I know that there is a certain emotion behind that. And I just have to go and find what is that emotion. So there may be sadness or a, a need for connection. Mm -hmm. You know, so I can go in through the emotion, I can go in through the need, but there's generally has nothing to do with the food. No. It's just a trigger. Never does. That never does. It's, and, and it's, you know, that I often say to people, when you want to lose weight, for instance, it's not about the food. Mm. Don't worry about the food. Let, let's look at the reasons why you're making these choices. Yeah. That's the empowerment because when you when you understand those boundaries that you set up for yourself or what, then you can you just make different decisions because it's soft boundaries. You have no energy. Mm -mm. There's no energy left. You're constantly giving to other people. You're allowing them to step over their boundaries your boundary to them energy wise it's draining yeah. yeah so identifying that is really important and identifying you know it's like um, when the when the pandemic first started everyone went home they baked cakes and baked bread because that was a return to the softer gentler times yeah. and those foods also create serotonin in the brain so it gives you a good serotonin hit um and but for many people they didn't stop doing that <laughs> you know when it was kind of we could go out it's still because those types of foods are addictive. Mm. So those understanding when your those your boundaries are soft, when you when you feel when you're not allowing yourself to recognize or acknowledge the fear. We've all been living in this low grade stress and anxiety for two years. And mm. so for many people, especially those with soft boundaries, as you were talking about, and rigid boundaries too, I must say, those firm boundaries. The, the extremes are, are caught wreaking habit. Yeah. And so if you're recognizing, you know, that, that I, my boundaries down and I'm feeling this fear rather than recognizing that I create my own reality, food is the thing that we reach for. It, it, yeah. You know, as I've often said to, to women, you know, it's okay for you to be sitting in your car at three o'clock in the afternoon waiting for children to be at, get out of school and eat a packet of Tim Tams. No one's going to say a word. You have a bottle of wine in your car and you're drinking from that, people are going to question you. So food becomes that easy way of dulling the senses. Same thing. It's exactly the same thing. It's just a way of dulling. And it, and it comes about through those boundaries that you just are letting go of. Yeah. Since we're already talking about children, I mean, we teach children how to have food around boundary, uh, boundaries around food. I know I grew up with a plate. That was my, my first memory of food. We had a, I was a very slow eater. 
Mm-hmm. And so my parents got this bowl that had a a young girl and a herd of ducklings. And it was it was heated with hot water from underneath. So the food would stay warm because I was eating so slowly. And there would be this enticement of, come on, let, not, not, not just another duck head, mm-hmm. another, you know, another, another little gosling or whatever they were. And they wouldn't stop until I finished the, the this plate, this, this bowl, this soup bowl, whatever it was. I had to finish my plate. So that was one of the things in our families is what you put on your plate, you would have to eat it. The problem was I was not always in charge of what went on my plate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and I know that I know people who were, who went flipped then straight into, into rigid boundaries. And then came, as we talked about, you know, like really strictly controlling what they would eat. Yes. Yes. And, and, you know, it starts right there. I think, I think as parents, we can do quite a bit of damage to our children. Because one of the things that I teach for women is to slow down their eating. It's actually a good thing because of the hormone um, leptin, which regulates your hunger, is yeah. able to work. But if you eat quickly, it can't. So yeah. it doesn't regulate. So children who eat slowly, that's actually honouring their their physiology. And I think, we, you know, this whole thing, you can't leave the table until your plate's finished, um, which is fine like letting children leave food on the plate, but you don't go then reward them with some ice cream later on. Like it's, you know, th- those are the, those are the criteria, but very much I think we've all done it is that we've rewarded children with food or restricted and told them they can't have dessert until they eat their dinner and you're not leaving the table until, even though you could, you know, you could say, I'm not hungry or I like to eat slowly. Uh, as parents, I think, and I know myself, I've fallen into it with, with it's, that's what you're eating tonight. Yeah. I, I know of parents who have that said, well, fine, you don't have to finish it, but you can uh, you finish it at your next meal. So they would serve the exact food again. Mm-hmm. Again, I mean, I don't want to interfere with per- parenting, but, you know, you can create all sorts of responses in the child of, no, no I'm not going to eat anything instead. That's right. And we, and, and listen, when, and tell me, I deal with the ramifications for that, you know, for women in their 40s and yes. 50s. I say women because that's who I mostly deal with. But I deal with that and that there'll be things like, you know, what about the four children in Africa? And if you're not eating, someone's going without and, yep. and you know, you do as I say, not as I do. And I know, I know, for instance, I have a client who whose family used to make her eat one particular vegetable, which she hated. Now, to this day, she still struggles to eat vegetables because there's an emotional connection yeah. around. I I didn't have the ability. They were terrible, it was like chocos, which is just dreadful anyway. But <laughs> and I, you know, I, I often laugh because my mother used to cook Brussels sprouts, and I still this day, so I still can't stand them. But she never <laughs> made a big deal of them. Whereas I'm married to somebody who absolutely loves them. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just, it really does impact on many of the choices we make later on because we either move into no one's going to tell me what to do which is those mm-hmm. rigid boundaries, I would say, to the soft boundaries with I have to do as I'm told. Yeah. And then you can wobble, you can, you can, you know, wobble back and forth with with the spongy boundaries, depending on who tells you what to eat and what not. Yeah. Like again, I, I would go home and there would be, you know, I'm gluten free. And I am not, it's not a fat. I am actually gluten free. I'm intolerant to gluten. I'm not thankfully I'm not a cel- celiac, but i I find it really hard to digest wheat or gluten in general. And I would come home and and I would be, but I baked, I baked a gluten-free cake for you. I I really, I eat cake very rarely. And because I don't do sugar particularly well. Yeah. So I had, it took me years to go, you know, like, no, I am not eating this. I came to a point where I would announce beforehand when I'm coming, I really look forward to seeing you. Please do not bake a cake. (laughs) That's right, which is interesting, isn't it? Because that's the way many people show love. Mm. Yes. By creating food. I know my grandmother, that was my grandmother. She just loved. Absolutely. You know, we'd go yes. to her house and there'd be cake everywhere. You name it, she bought it and ate it, made it, you know, lamingtons and lemon tarts and jam roll up. Like yeah. just, but that was her way in those days. Of, and coming post war era where you couldn't get sugar and you couldn't mm-hmm. get. For her, it was very important to be able to do that for the family. 
Um, so there's a, I remember one day we were talking about going up and visiting a cousin of mine, and I little their little ones are um, his children are little. I said, oh, I'll take them up from Fredo Frogs. And I stopped myself and I thought, what am I doing? So every time Aunty Sally comes up, they get food. Mm -hmm. What's that? What what relationship am I creating with these yeah. kids? So we got colouring pencils and books instead. But it was really interesting for me to stop and think, what am I setting up here? Mm -hmm. What what you know that that my gift to you is food, and that's gonna you know it. But it's so permeated in our society. I find with with me it, with my clients in particular, people don't recognise the emotional impact of food, and because then they swing many swing totally to those rigid boundaries you were talking yep. about, yes. because they want to be in control. Yeah. Um, and I've done that. I've come to a place where, you know, like, okay, I came with my, with my family. I came to a place. I said, you want to eat cake, please feel free to eat cake. I'm not going to stop you from eating what you want, but don't sit in front of me and go, oh, just a little bite, you know? And, and so I came to a place where I, if I knew that I was going to events where there was food that I didn't want to eat, I would bring my own food. Yeah. 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 But that's, 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 that's honoring you. It could flip into rigid. It's I've also I also know people who have literally said, you know, it's like we're going to a restaurant. We're going to I think we were going to a Thai restaurant. Yeah. And in the end, because there was one friend who could only eat steamed vegetables and salmon that had been cooked in olive oil. So we ended up going to a restaurant when neither of us and the whole group wanted to go because it was way out of our price range. And we didn't really want to eat that kind of food. We wanted to eat Thai food. And it was a great lesson in learning that there's some flexibility around food is important oh. as long as it doesn't interfere with your allergies and food intolerances. That's exactly right. And and I think, you know, one of the things I learned, because I actually had very many, lots of food rules, um, you know, in the fitness industry, that's when we live by them, that change every decade. Um, yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. And the, and the thing about it is that, you know, that making a decision about um, food and because we, you know, I think in flexible boundaries we're talking about intuitive eating, which I'm very much mm -hmm. a proponent of. Intuitive eating is that it's, it's your body will always support you no matter what you do. Yeah. So um, it's okay if you, like we, this Christmas and, you know, I was eating Normally, I wouldn't eat dairy, but I did. Now I'm paying for it. <laughs> it's taken me a couple of days for my body to, to, and it just reminds me, this isn't good for you. Yeah. It happens, no run rigid, but I'm going to enjoy that pavlova that my friend made with lots of, you know, fruit and passion fruit. Oh, it's delicious. And I knew, I knew two days later or a day later that I was going to feel it, and I do. So, I'm not going to deny myself eating that because that only creates more issues around those boundaries. It just makes you an awful person to be around sometimes. <laughs> but that's the choice between soft and flexible. You made a conscious choice to do that, whereas and there was no guilt or shame attached to it. It was a conscious decision, right? And I absolutely enjoyed it. Yeah. Because I think when you've got those flexible boundaries, what you're doing is rec you recognize, number one, that your body will always support you. So you don't have to go all one way. I think that's the problem. Um, you know, we've got rising cases of what we call orthorexia, or or orthorexia, orthorexia, I'm trying to get my word out, the orthorexia, which is people who will only eat certain foods, yeah. like your friend going to the restaurant. That's not healthy because that creates a metabolic issue in the body and and so you know i just happen to be reading a book at the moment talking about poor metabolic health and that's a lot of that's come from these very rigid boundaries that people have set up about what you can and can't eat yeah it's an amazing amazing vessel mm. um and very much powered by what you believe about yourself and so being able to have those flexible boundaries to me is empowerment um, okay. either, either, end of the, either end of the scale is not good. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about um, food at work because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have any boundaries or not, not any. I, I, I don't want to generalize too much, but there people don't, don't necessarily set boundaries around food. They mm -hmm. eat in front of the computer. 
while they're working, right? They snack in between because there's the box at the at the reception that says, you know, just one dollar for this good cause, and you get a Mars bar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> every every office you go into, exactly the same. And I used to in one office as I, I in one office I worked in many years ago, there was a box right next to me. Mm. And people would come and eat out of this box all the time. And they would say, aren't you in this all the time? And I go, no. No. Oh, I thought I had turned off the reminders, but no, I hadn't. Okay. So, um, hmm? No, it's just, I would say, I don't eat that. It's not my kind of food. And they go, yeah, I don't know how you do this. Because mm. I know how I feel afterwards when I've eaten it. And that's the key isn't it really? Like instead of, you know, number number one, eating in front of the computer um, is, is probably the, 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 it's a habit so many people have got into because we need this to feel we're connected. You know, that's why most organisations have lunch breaks mm-hmm. because it's, it's essential for you, for your brain to yep. come out of a, an air conditioned office if you can get outside even better and actually enjoy your food rather than their mindless, which is that's what it is when you're sitting by the computer, mindlessly eating. It's almost like we, we don't allow ourselves to just be. We have to be doing. Yeah. A- and that comes back to self-value and self-worth because who am I to take half an hour off to eat lunch? You know, mm-hmm. I'm busy and the world will fall apart without me. Well, if you're that busy that you can't take, then you need to look. There's another area you need to look at is where your boundaries, you've got those soft boundaries around work. And yeah. you're not allowing those in positions of power to recognize um, that that's what you need. And that, that comes back to those soft boundaries again. Yeah. Where you're allowing yourself to be walked over. And I have to, I, I, I you know, I put my hand up. I used to do that. I, when I was working in a job, um, you know, normal job, normal job, um, I would sit needing it at my desk. I look back on that now at times when I didn't feel um, worthy. I always felt that I had to work hard. I had to prove myself consistently. And that if I, and you know, I happened to work in an organisation where um, taking breaks was actually looked down on. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, you've got a little bit of time on your hands, have you? You know, so... Um, so we fall into that sabotage space where we where we're sabotaging ourselves because we don't value ourselves. Mm-hmm. Regular breaks are better for you. That's what so many companies are introducing nap rooms now. Um, but taking those breaks is is good for your creativity. But those those soft boundaries right there, and you know, having boxes of chocolate sitting at the reception desk and you put the dollar in, you're not getting any you're not getting any more um, productivity out of anybody. They're going to go a lovely sugar hit. And then half an hour later, they're back from all because yeah. that's what they need. Because yeah, it's so lovely and addictive, right? Sugar. It is terribly addictive. Oh, the quality of food that we're eating, there's some boundaries around that as well. There, there are certain things that I just won't eat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody said, you know, it's really important that we take processed food out of our diet. And I'm like, because everything is so hyper processed. And I go, yeah, if you have a look at my pantry, the only thing you will find there are some cans of tomatoes. And then I've got mountains of fresh vegetables and fruit in my fridge because mm. I go to the farmer's market every week. I don't have a problem with processed food because I don't I don't eat them. I like eating as close to nature as possible. Mm-hmm. So if there is processed food available only occasionally, yes, then I can, you know, I can stretch the boundary a bit. But it's not what I would eat as a regular day to day. But I talk to people who say I don't have time. I have to eat what's available. So they go and get the fast food and the you know, the, the so-called salads that are just absolutely, you know, like have all the preservatives and all of that in there because they come in plastic bowls with, you know, whatever. And it's yeah. like, that's not food. And, and you know, it's, uh, what's really interesting is that processed food is is actually manufactured in order yeah. for us to eat more. Yeah. That's what it's designed for. I was I was on a um, on a call just recently with a, they were talking about a, a new variety of corn chips are being produced in the states right now doritos every Every, only every fifth yeah has chili yes the whole purpose because it's not real chili Mm -hmm. it's manufactured 
but the whole purpose is you have one you go looking for so you eat more you keep eating it to find that's and it's designed like that anything with industrial seed oils which they call vegetable oils and just, there's some of some flowers aren't vegetables but those those seed oils in the body the body is searching for the real food mm-hmm. so um some so things like for instance let's let's talk about um foods that have um artificial sugars or sweeteners all that's doing is setting up in your brain the desire to eat more because of what what your body wants is the hit that comes from sugar. Yeah. When it's processed, it it doesn't have the same impact physiologically on our body because it's a chemical. Yeah. So this the body is still looking, and we need some sugars. You, that's still bad age, about 25, 20 mm. grams of sugar. Um, it, your body requires in order to keep going, and that mostly comes from fruits and vegetables and mm. occasional biscuit. That's okay. Um, but but to look at those processed foods because there's another soft boundary. What's happening is our food is being designed. The whole reason that food technologists and scientists have jobs is to create foods we will continue to eat. Yeah. So things like my thing used to be twisties. I loved them as a kid, and because I could only have, I got to the root cause of the why I actually crave them. My fourth birthday party. My mum put, we remember I'd have junk food when we were kids. Mum was way ahead of the time. Um, not, never had desserts or anything. There was always a piece of fruit after dinner. I think if it came down, couldn't afford it, basically. But she was very good like that. But for my fourth birthday, um, she bought me twisties, which is so exciting. But, of course, growing up in a family, would be go and give some to everybody else first. Oh. By the time it got back to me, there may be some little, and I was, I remember being so disappointed. Now, it was Richard said through EFT that I discovered this. Why do I eat? Once I start on these twisties, I can't stop, even though they're chemicals and blah, 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 colouring. And I'm a yep. bit, that's what it was. Yeah. Frightened I wouldn't get another twisty like when I was my fourth birthday. The minute I cleared that, um, I still have, you know, if we're out somewhere or picnic or someone's got some twisties, I may have one, two or three and I'm fine. Mm-hmm. Because, oh, whoa, that's a chemical storm right there happening. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, it, that, it's okay to have that stuff occasionally. Yeah. Because if, you most, if your diet's mostly honoring and having those flexible boundaries around the food, I'm a great believer that the minute you're in restriction, you're, you're, you're going to, you, your yeah. soft boundaries will happen further down the track. You know, every, every diet, there's an equal and opposite binge just waiting to happen. And 97% of people who, go on restrictive diets with these strong boundaries, will gain weight by the end of that year, usually more. Yes. So the body has this amazing, because that's what your body will do. If you're going to put it in restriction, you've got these firm boundaries around that's not how your body works. It's not how it works. So you in your mind creating these firm boundaries and eventually your willpower and determination goes because that's too hard for the brain to hang on to that. Yeah. And so we let go. And then what your body goes looking for is, please don't do this to me again. I'm going to, like, eat, 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 eat. Please don't let me do this again. And, you know, your metabolism drops because you're, you're calorie restricting in those stark ones. I think right now, too, because of our access to the internet, and there's so many people with so many ideas, uh, it can be really easy to forget you. It, it's you are in control. What works for you isn't going to necessarily work for everybody else. And I think there's this tendency that to jump on board to a very rigid way of doing it as if it's the only way. Yeah. But there are people whose job is to come up with that idea. Yep. They're funded by somebody, usually, to come up with an idea. And, you know, we've, as you and I have both been through, we've been through it all. I mean, it just changes all the time. But that's because the scientists and people in the industry are funded to mm. create the new way of eating. And as we age in particular, letting go and having those flexible boundaries and accessing your wisdom and listening to your intuition and not being so rigid in those firm boundaries is just so critically important because times are changing so far. Mm. That's what we about- believed a year ago is not necessarily what we're going to believe today. So yeah. Exactly. So it's really important to listen to ourselves. And and again, it's, there's also, I think, a little bit of re-education as to what are good foods. Mm-hmm. Because, I, you know, you talk to children 
and they go by the which is what the what the food industry has done they go by mouthfeel you know just the right amount of sugar just the right amount of so sugar salt and and fat are the three ma major food groups right yeah. and and so you give children real food you give them fruits and vegetables the mouthfeel is completely different and they don't like it because it doesn't taste familiar and it isn't sweet, overly sweet, because, you know, again, it's all becoming addictive. And when we take that into adulthood and then we we have times where we get together and there is cake and there's twisties and there's all of this stuff that we 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 are eating because we're used to it. But we we don't necessarily know that it's bad for us. So, again, setting the boundaries that work for you. And, and again, as you said, it's not about letting go of anything. It's just about eating it with an awareness of what works and what doesn't. And not about pleasing other people, but pleasing yourself. That's right. And I think that's a really good point, Angela. I think, you know, when we do, when we, when our soft boundaries, when we have those soft boundaries, we, we can't listen to our own bodies mm -hmm. because we've given up yeah. that intuition. We've given up our power. And to be able to say, like you did, look, you guys can have some cake. That'd be wonderful. Just I, I, right now, it's not good for me. That's a, that's not. I mean, it's not. And being able to withstand the looks. But I'm so disappointed. I made this. Ex yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, that, you know, um, that's, that's right. That's where they came from. Yeah. Know, where they yeah. came from. I, I was very fortunate, I guess, in a way that I didn't grow up in a family where food was the center of love. And we, we were too busy playing sport. My mother just literally <laughs> threw it on the table as we were running through and grabbed it. So, you know, our meals were pretty basic when we were kids. <laughs> um, whereas I married somebody who, where food was very much yeah. the center of their family life. Um, we had a saying in our family, love goes through the stomach. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So, and and I think the people whose boundaries feel soft in that area, it really is looking at what what has food represented to me in the past. Yeah. How have I used food uh, in order to stuff down an emotion rather than speak it? How have I used it? I mean, I remember, you know, we were just talking before. I remember once my my daughter and I had this. She was about she would have been about thirteen, I think, twelve, and she wanted to go to a party, but there were no parents. We had this huge big argument and she was stormed off and she was leaving home and she had her, she went upstairs, came down, she had a pillow under her arm, she had a backpack on her back and her phone in her hand. And I said, I'm leaving. Well, we lived in a gate of the state at the end of a very long road. I have no idea where she thought she was heading to. She had a phone in her hand. And I just reached and grabbed the phone. Well, she just lost it. You know, so it's my phone. <laughs> Take my phone. We paid for that. Anyway, there was big to do. I went and found her. She was sitting in the bushes crying. Come back says, how about we have some ice cream, honey? Sit on the bed and talk. And what we got to at the bottom was that everybody else was going to the party. And it was only just because Facebook had been, you know, recently, you know, developed. The kids were sharing all the photos and she felt she was going to be left out. She said to me um, a couple of days later, she said, I'm really glad you still let me go because I was too scared. I was too scared to go, but I just, everybody else was going. So we used ice cream at that point as a connection, yeah. you know, to just sit and just as a connection food, um, mum and daughter, okay, let's just sit and just have a chat, ice cream and let's just have a chat. And so that was okay in that scenario. It's when it becomes a habit that you do it all the time. Yeah. Um, as it turns out, she's now quite the foodie and cooks the most amazing foods and she, you know, doesn't eat much junk food. But it was that moment where it's okay to do that. So that's a flexible yeah. boundary. So, yes. let, you know, not, oh, I'm not going to let my children have ice cream. I'm never going to, I mean, I was the mother. No child of mine's having chocolate. <laughs> Lasted for the first six months of my first child. I remember my mother saying, oh, for goodness sake, a piece of chocolate's not going to kill him, for God's sake. <laughs> but I was so rigid about what and it was made all his own stuff he was totally breastfed you know blah 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 man and that it, you know that was great as a start but it certainly didn't make the world of difference yeah. it made me very tired <laughs> but the good thing is is you went and had a look at it and you decided what was working and what wasn't and that's that's would be my invitation and I, i'm sure yours as well to everybody who's watching and listening look at why you've got the food rules you have whether they're soft or rigid and whether they add up as spongy or how flexible you are around them so feel what you're feeling look at what your needs are that you're fulfilling or not fulfilling and then enjoy every single bite absolutely 
So thank you so much, Sally. This was wonderful. And I know we can talk for hours about this and we probably will. Um, and um, everybody, thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you next time. Thanks, Angela.